be official. Okay, super. Well, thank you so much. We're excited to be here today. Um, we're going to be joined by our panelists, uh, Charlie Nutt, uh, here from here at Nakata, and also Lynn Raybender from uh, the Association of Public Land Grant Universities. And as I said, my name is Jennifer Jocelyn. Charlie, we are ready to go. I'm excited to turn over the webinar to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. It is so exciting to see nearly 350 people with us um, today and joining us. So uh, welcome to all of you who are here. We're so very excited to have you here. And we'll go ahead and get started. One of my favorite quotes as I think about higher education was, was made by John W. Gardner, who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare to President Lyndon Johnson. And he said, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. I think that pretty much describes higher education in many ways these days, as we look at lots of issues that are occurring in our country, but internationally. Um, some of those unsolvable problems that people talk about are things such as student retention, student persistence, student's graduation, student success. How do you work with students in order for them to be as successful as possible in a timely manner, graduate in a timely manner, and then move into a successful field of career as they move forward? Many times those unsolvable problems deal with the fact that we have not really talked about a culture shift, and that that culture shift is what really changes how a campus deals with those problems. Instead of them becoming problems, they really become those brilliantly disguised problems that are great opportunities for change. Just like the song says, no man is an island, and no Jennifer, I'm not gonna start singing, so don't panic here. Um, no man is an island. Uh, no unit on our campus is an island. Uh, we can't work in silos. We can't work in, in units that don't talk and don't communicate. And so in order to really create a culture shift, it includes the entire institution. It includes the entire university working together toward a common goal, toward a common pathway toward success of our students. This can only happen through an open dialogue, communication, and a common understanding of the issues. And that's really what our webinar about is about today is that in order to truly enhance academic advising for our students on our campuses, we've got to make a culture shift in which advising is seen as a teaching and learning activity. It is not something that's done to register students. It is not simply scheduling. It's not a transactional event. It's something that occurs in that relationship between the advisor and the student that truly changes that student's life, life, who truly works to work with them to learn what they need to do in order to be successful. Technology is important to that relationship as it enables us to increase the level of that relationship. But technology on itself doesn't change academic advising. Technology on itself is not the culture shift we're talking about. We're talking about changing our campuses to where advising is seen as an integral piece of our academic mission. However, on many of our campuses, part of that problem and that culture shift is the lack of communication between those at the executive cabinet level and frontline advisors and administrators. And I believe that a great deal of that lack of communication really comes down to the fact that there's a lack of common vocabulary about what academic advising is. There's a lack of common understanding of the value of an academic advising in students' lives, and there's a lack of common, of a common understanding of the theories and practice that really puts advising at a place that's so far beyond a registration model. So it's not a situation in which either the executive cabinet or the advisors don't want to talk together. It's the fact that how do we build that common language? How do we be, how are we assured that both of those groups of folks have a common understanding of where we need to be 
by understanding what advising is. So I'm very excited that we've been able to partner and work with APLU. I'm excited about the work they're doing in reaching out directly to executive cabinet members and cabinet leaders on a campus through a series of online courses to truly um, help them to understand what academic advising is, to help them understand the value of that relationship between an advisor and a student, whether that be a faculty advisor, a primary advisor, a peer advisor, but to help them understand what that value is of that relationship, to help them understand how technology supports that, but is not used in lieu of that, and to help cabinet level um, administrators have that level of conversation with frontline advisors using the same common language. So the courses that APOUs have developed, truly I am so impressed with because they open up that dialogue. The Kata at the same time has developed a series of online tutorials specifically geared at frontline advisors and administrators to be sure that we know that language, that theory, that practice, so that we open up that dialogue with our upper level administrators we're able to, to have a conversation in which we are both talking the same language. So much of miscommunication really does come down to a lack of understanding of our common language and our common theory and our common desire for the success of students. So what we want to do today is spend some time having Lynn talk about the APLU project have the, um, Jennifer then talk about the Nakata online tutorial project. And then at the end, I'll try to bring back together how these two products or these two projects together can help a campus, but to also talk about how even without these products or these projects, that a campus can build that level of communication that's so important across the university. So Jennifer, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn and she can begin talking about APLU. Lynn, thank you so much for being here. Please thank Megan on behalf of, of myself and Nakata for her support of the work that you're doing, and we're so excited to have you with us today. So Lynn, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie, and we are really excited to be able to join you all today to talk about the work that APLU has been engaged with at the institution level to really support that type of proactive, personalized, student-centered um, advising redesign work. Um, so we're excited to share that work today as well. Um, so my name is Lynn Brabender. I am a program manager at the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. I'm going to start briefly by giving you an overview of APLU's vision and mission, if you're not as familiar with our association. Um, then we'll talk about the campus-wide proactive advising approach that we've seen many institutions successfully taking to really increase uh, student success and degree completion. I'll move on to talk about the, a smart approach to student success, which is the course that we developed to support additional institutions in scaling up some of those best practices that we've seen at these leading institutions. Um, then I'll give you a course tour, a couple of screenshots of what's um, part of our course, and then talk about how institutions that have already um, engaged in the course material are using it to engage leadership um, and develop plans to revise their processes, what have you. So we will move right into APLU. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. We are a research policy and advocacy organization dedicated to strengthening and advancing the work of public universities. Um, we work in three primary areas, um, degree completion and academic and student success, advancing scientific research, and expanding engagement. So APLU was founded in 1887, originally to support land-grant institutions, which were founded with the Morrill Act in 1862, to support um, land-grant institutions primarily with that mission of increasing access to higher education among uh, working-class communities. So we really can continue with that mission and vision of increasing access, particularly among the most underserved populations. Um, now we are 236 public research universities, including land-grant institutions, state university systems, and other affiliated organizations. Um, so 
Next, we're going to move right into what we've been working on when it comes to advising. So again, one of our pillars being increasing degree completion and student success. Um, we've really seen that successful institutions over the last 10 years have taken a really strategic look at how they're serving students and where those advising gaps are. Um, as we, a lot of us know, um, though there are many support systems available to students, whether it's financial aid and registration and career services, academic advising, counseling services, they often operate in silos and are not integrated in a cohesive manner that best supports students. And as a result, students have difficulty navigating these systems and fall off track. So many institutions are taking an approach, you may have heard of something called IPASS, Integrated Planning and Advising for Student Success. Um, but whether or not you use that acronym, we've really seen that the most successful in institutions are doing three things. They're taking strategic action to really integrate those student support services across their campus. So again, looking as this illustrates at where that student can be in the center. Where are they touching students? Where are the gaps? And where, how can they um, change processes and structures to better facilitate that integration? So they're really taking a three-pronged model. So really facilitating that integration across the campus, taking a collaborative approach to um, facilitating those advising services and student support services, changing the processes and structures to better facilitate that integration, and then incorporating the use of technology to support those structural and process changes. Next slide, please. So as Charlie mentioned, this really encompasses an entire institution-wide cultural change. Um, so for institutions that want to integrate um, their student supports and their advising services and really facilitate that more proactive, personalized system, they've taken strategic actions to change their structures. For example, moving from a centralized to a decentralized advising model or creating um, different reporting structures. Um, they've implemented process changes, for example, changing um, the role of the advisor from a faculty-centric model to an advisor-centric model with faculty as the mentor. Um, and what we've really seen um, with the institutions that are most successful is that these two changes have to coincide with attitudinal changes. So again, that's really creating these collaborative cross-functional student success teams where institutional research now feels as though student success is part of their responsibility, right? They're along with, institute, uh, with IT and academic affairs and student affairs and faculty and deans and advisors, really all collaborating and this feeling that their role is to support those students and to support the best advising structure possible. Next slide, please. And technology, when incorporated on top of these process and structural changes can really support this model. Um, and the main areas where technology um, supports this model is in education planning, counseling and coaching, and risk targeting and intervention. Um, the primary tools being degree planning um, and uh, early alert systems facilitated through data analytics, um, also tools for facilitating communication between faculty and advisors. Um, when implemented correctly, this can really allow for that transition that Charlie was talking about from advisor as registrar to advisor as a personalized um, teacher uh, and really facilitate that teaching and learning model. Um, it also has been shown to, when implemented correctly and when everyone's using it on campus, um, to really facilitate better communication between faculty and advisors about students. Almost similar to a medical record, advisors can put notes into a system alongside faculty and facilitate a more of a roundabout, uh, close the loop process of really supporting and proactively supporting those students. Um, data analytics has really been shown to be able to promote shared ownership across uh, about student success across the campus. Some of the institutions that we've worked with um, report out across the, all campus teams about student success, success metrics weekly. Um, again, reinforcing that ownership. Um, I know that Sydney McPhee likes to say, know your numbers. Um, next slide, please. 
So speaking of Sydney McPhee, um, so I wanted to illustrate one of our successful campuses. Um, about three years ago, a Middle Tennessee State University, um, led by President Sydney McPhee, who actually was an advisor himself at one point and also very involved with NACADA, um, in fact, was on the board of directors, um, they decided to take a really strategic look at how they can increase their student success metrics, persistence, degree completion. Um, they decided to identify advising reform as a top priority. So they facilitated a student survey and a faculty survey, and they used that data to develop a plan. And in that plan, they decided to decentralize advising into the colleges and develop a new accountability structure. So again, that's that structural change. Um, and so with that structure, each um, they hired advisors and placed them into the colleges. They also placed advisor managers into the colleges. And so each advisor now specialized in just the degrees in that college, was accountable to the advisor manager who was then accountable to the dean. So the dean, this new accountability structure, made the dean responsible for student success metrics, which he then and she then reported to the president um, at their what they call student success hearings. Um, this was three years ago when they started implementing these changes. Also, alongside this, a data analytics and early warning system um, so that in, uh, advisors could really focus and specialize and act as those case managers. So over the past three years, they've seen almost an 8% increase in freshman retention. Um, and also freshmen earning at least 30 credit hours in their first semester has increased significantly as well. So I'd like to highlight them as an exemplar. Next slide, please. Which brings us to um, introducing a smart approach to student success. So about a year and a half ago, um, you know, we had heard, oops, it looks like we just lost the slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, give me a second. My PowerPoint decided to restart. So oh, give, me just, give me just a, t a second here. Go ahead, Lynn. OK. Um, I, can, I could just keep talking, I suppose. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, one second. Let that. Um, should I keep talking? Yeah, go ahead. It'll be just a second here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, I see ahead. it. Wonderful. So, um, so basically, a year and a half ago, um, you know, we had been hearing from many two and four year institutions that really want to replicate this type of model, but really didn't know where to start. Um, I'm, you know, Georgia State University is really known as the uh, forerunner we're out in the forefront on this work, and they receive over 100 site visits a year from other institutions wanting to replicate what they've done. So what we decided to do is to identify five different institutions that were doing really great work, um, two two-year institutions and two um, and three four-year institutions, and go and visit these institutions and really see what they've done to see the success that they've seen. Um, next slide, please. if we could advance it. Oh, we're not. Oops, sorry. I can't. Uh, Jennifer, you, I think you're muted, Jennifer. So sorry about that. Uh, my apologies to our audience. Uh, we're going to have Lee go ahead. My computer is. Um, actively participating in the webinar by not cooperating. L uh, Lynn, go ahead. Oh, sure. Would you like me to share my screen? Or, I, or this works too. Lee, Lee has it up. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Great. All right. So, um, so we identified, we worked with an advisory panel um, of leaders in the field of post-secondary degree completion and also in advising design and reform um, and identified um, five different institutions that we just that we would go visit um, we also worked with our resource partners to identify the most up-to-date research that really supports this model and supports this work um, Nakata being one of those um, resource partners as well as achieving the dream the project was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation we worked extensively with the Community College Research Center um, Educause and also Titan partners um, so basically what we did is we visited Colorado State University, Georgia State University, Middle Tennessee State University, Austin Community College, and Watkins Community College. And we interviewed everyone from the president, the provost, the director of student success, advisors, advisor managers, deans, students, faculty, 
all about how they had really taken this approach to, again, assess what they were doing, integrate those services, change processes, change structures, and really create that collaborative sense of ownership of student success across their campus. Um, we captured about 100 hours worth of video um, and, and um, pulled together all of our resources and developed activities and curated that video into a six lesson um, online course um, that's delivered on an online platform. Next slide. If it works. Yay. <laughs> so here is a screenshot of the final product. So basically what we did, and again, the, this resource is, we launched this resource two weeks ago nationally. Um, and the resource is really driven by the interviews that we captured, again, with that entire um, collection of leadership at each institution. Um, the six lessons include activities and resources that are pertinent to that topic. They also include about 30 minutes each of curated video. So the video content includes what we call an anchor video. So the anchor video um, is about seven minutes long and illustrates, kind of it encompasses all of the five institutions' uh, voices and how it really anchors the uh, learner in what lessons are going to be addressed in that session. Um, then the other video content that we have, we have called campus experience videos. You can advance the next slide. Um, campus experience, or actually advanced twice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, campus experience videos uh, address how one institution addressed a particular um, piece of implementation guidance uh, within that particular lesson. Um, here we have Georgia State and Austin Community College. They're about three minutes long. And then on each page, we have um, what we call campus voices. And again, anywhere between one campus voice to six campus voices on each page, um, speaking to their experience, whether they're a student or um, a provost or a president or an advisor manager or an advisor of these changes and what their role was against pertaining to the specific lesson content. Um, can you go back two slides, please? Thank you. So again, this illustrates the content that we have in the course. Um, you'll see the lessons at the bottom here. Um, the first lesson really speaks to um, identifying why proactive advising and advising in general is important in advancing the national call to action around student success and increasing access to post-secondary education um, and illustrates the role of technology and how we just kind of have laid out that model. Um, lesson two, all of the lessons, by the way, have an extra introduction and a summary page and then contain about four pages of lessons in between. Next slide, please. To illustrate that. So this will show you the landing page for lesson five. So for example, this lesson is about communicating strategically and addressing challenges. Um, here you would find um, guidance from various institutions about um, how to communicate about change, but particularly about training as a communication strategy. So I like to focus on this um, lesson um, in that we have uh, an interview with Carol Cohen, um, who is the director of the Advisement Center at Georgia State University. Um, and they were very strategic in how they developed an advisor career ladder. Um, so you can go to this lesson, you can see the video, which you'll see here, Georgia State University Advisor Training Model. And then you can read the interview with um, Carol Cohen. And then we have activities linked at the bottom, which again are um, mostly PDFs and Excel spreadsheets that can really guide you through those planning processes if you were to read the, watch the video, read the interview, and then plan your own um, uh, strategy for developing an advisor training model and advisor career ladder. So advance two slides, please. <laughs> Thank you. I like to also highlight the media gallery. So again, this resource is very uh, video content based and we intended it to be that way. We really wanted this to be an opportunity for um, leadership at colleges and universities to almost go to five different site visits um, and from their, from, <laughs> from their own institution. So here at the Media Gallery, um, if you'll notice there's a search bar. If you go into the search bar, everything is tagged. So for example, if you wanted to search for an advisor talking about collaboration, you could do that and you'll find an advisor talking about collaboration. Or if you want to, to see a um, director of student success talking about um, faculty training, director of student success, faculty training, and you'll find that as well. Next slide. 
So finally, so we want, launched this again a couple of weeks ago. We have 60 institutions currently um, using this um, course right now with their um, institutions. Um, there are many ways that you can use the course. Um, if you were just to sit down and go through the entire course in one sitting, it would probably take about eight hours. Again, there's 180 minutes of video, um, and then there's there are there's you know written content on each page. However, there are also activities and resources between eight and 13 resources per lesson. And again, those are research research reports of such. So. We've recommended multiple different ways to do it. You could explore the lessons on your own. Um, we really encourage institutions to use this as a tool to engage a campus team. So, you know, for example, you could move to a lesson, and it's also it's asynchronous and it's self-paced. So you can jump in at any point. Um, when you enroll in the course, you have access for over a year. Um, so we really um, have heard a lot of feedback from our institutions around how they've used this course with a team to almost either assign certain content to certain uh, student success groups and then use that to guide their meetings moving forward. Um, we've had um, a, one institution where they use this to engage their executive leadership in some of the reforms that they were making at the project level to advising um, and had a lot of success in encouraging support for that work by doing that. Um, we've also had other institutions go the other direction and really assign these lessons on an ongoing basis over it with plans to do it over the next six weeks. So assign lesson one, read the resources, and then use the activities to really plan your next steps implementing these changes on your campus. Um, we really think that this provides um, a really great foundation for engaging leadership and the importance of um, of investing in advisor professional development. And that's why we're so happy to be um, partnering with Nakata um, around providing these resources that we hope can really be complementary. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer to describe the e-tutorial uh, professional development resources that Nakata has developed. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. And what a terrific segue. Um, it is so always a treat to talk about advisor training and development. And then now more and more, um, Nakata, EPLU, so many other our partner organizations are talking about the larger context in which advising exists on the campus. And so, such a terrific time to be talking about advising. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I always uh, say that uh, training and development is all about putting the best advisor in the seat. Uh, that's really the number one goal. And, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, who said that? Who is the first person to say that? And honestly, yeah, that's right. Uh, so one of the reasons that we love to talk about training and development and to put it in the larger context is that advising matters. Advising makes a difference. And more and more we have the research and scholarship uh, to support uh, those kinds of uh, claims and recommendations. And again, this is a climate in which, well, well we've always been talking about student success. Uh, we're joined, of course, obviously by APLU, which has a long history of doing that. Uh, we now see a lot of conversation all over the country and all over the world about students meeting their academic, personal, um, and uh, career goals through certificates, through associate degrees, through bachelor's degrees, and that focus again and again on student graduation and student success. And we know that advising as a structured experience, not an accidental thing, not only a hallway conversation, not, not all about scheduling and registration, that structured connection, which is a result of a coherent, effective delivery. Um, and of course, the, gauge, the, the goal is always engage students working with timely, consistent, and accurate advisors. And that's really our goal through uh, the e-tutorials and um, really everything that Nakata does to advance the field. We put this in a bigger context, much uh, very and very similar to what Lynn described, uh, this, con this concept that there's capacity and how do we organize for change? We address capacity. We also take a look at advising practices. What are some ways in which we are putting pieces together? And then tools, 
uh, are our tools in line with our vision? Are they in line with the practices? So for example, um, the APLU and our, and our partnership uh, across the country that focuses on developing strong vision and mission statements for advising uh, in, imbued and in, just really embedded in kind of the leadership and vision for a campus. And that is matched then by structure and, and that coherent approach to um, delivering the most effective advising possible. And training development is a, such a huge part of that. That's, those are the ways in which we say, how do you organize for change? How do you promote that culture shift if there is not an engaged uh, body and an engaged way in which your campus is organizing um, for these kinds of learning, for ongoing development, and then for change? And what about your advising practices? Is, is a, what, how are you using your intervention? How how can you do proactive advising if it's not part of maybe an early warning system, if it's not built into advisor-student relationships, if it's not part of coherent academic planning, if you're not using the analytics and technology available to take a look at different student populations and to intervene appropriately with student populations, and are your technology tools reflective of uh, the capacity and practices, the goals that you're trying to meet as a campus. So these are, this is the context in which we're doing the e-tutorials. The e-tutorials are three and a half week short courses, and they're not designed to replace a certificate or an undergraduate or a graduate uh, degree in academic advising. They are designed to help a campus provide foundational training um, and also to create, again, that language and culture that Charlie and Lynn have talked about, the ways in which we make a whole campus advising center make a whole campus talking about student outcomes, student learning, and graduation. So we, um, we have the theory and practice, which is really our foundational e-tutorial. Um, we do quite a bit of work on uh, the understanding theories in the field, understanding uh, different approaches and how they're based in developmental and other theories, especially advising and teaching. And then the last two weeks of this particular e-tutorial focus very heavily on practice. We have other e-tutorials too to offer, and so I just wanna highlight a little bit. Uh, we have an e-tutorial on working with uh, uh, undecided students, we have a nice focus there on the literature, uh, on career planning and career exploration and self-knowledge and self-assessment. And then that um, comes together in the last uh, few weeks when uh, participants try to build, really build the curriculum for what exploratory students or undecided students on their campus uh, might go through as part of, again, creating a coherent academic plan that leads to major selection, uh, that leads to that self-exploration so important as students progress through pathways or campuses organized for meta-majors um, and how we can help students, even undecided students, even exploratory students, be on a path uh, to success. The um, newest e-tutorials are focusing on those, uh, those programs that try to build capacity through using peer advisors or, or peer students, knowing of course that working with um, juniors and seniors or second year students for two year institutions, those advanced students in your caseload gain so much from working and being in a teaching relationship with newer students. We know that retention is improved and, and um, uh, correlated positively with engaging in those peer-to-peer -peer activities. And we know, of course, also that uh, this is invaluable for new students. So this hands-on, very practical uh, e-tutorial is all about um, creating the best peer advising or improving your peer advising program uh, to address effective practice today. And then our brand new uh, e tutorial is on advising first generation students. And this is an e tutorial where we rely heavily on the great work being done at Kansas State University and the College of Education um, on exactly how, uh, what the student experience is of first-generation students, and exactly how we can transform the ways in which we're meeting student needs. Uh, so this is a, a really terrific opportunity to focus on a very specific student population, which of course includes uh, every student on your campus, every, every uh, minoritized or every at-risk student population, uh, no matter 
uh, the uh, background of students, uh, we see a lot of appl applicability here when we focus on first generation students. So uh, that's an example of how we're using theory informed uh, literature and scholarship to talk about application of, of the right approaches and application of uh, innovative practices uh, to meet student needs. All of the e-tutorials are application oriented and so participants leave with not only the language to talk to campus leaders but also uh, multiple uh, ideas and practices that either they have improved or can explore um, explore uh, creating and modifying uh, for their own campus. All of the e-tutorials, and Lee, go ahead and go forward. So here's an example. Um, uh, the theory and practice e-tutorial is part of building a personal philosophy. So we're drawing on theory, we're drawing on application to really address mission and vision uh, with that. All of our e-tutorials meet uh, are part of our Nakata strategic plan or strategic goals. They focus on communicating the scholarship and building good practice based on that scholarship. They're all about um, offering professional develop opportunities that meet uh, not only the needs of advisors and advising administrators, but more and more the direct needs of, of a campus or a system or a state. Um, so we feel uh, very positive in our contributions in that direction and uh, expanding the use of innovative technology tools and resources. Uh, participants who go through uh, the learning management system and who take part in Zoom meetings and uh, go through this interactive, they experience the learning management system or a similar learning management system that their students experience. So they can talk about being a learner in that environment. They also are using tools to, that they could use with online learners, or they could be using with study abroad and other students. So uh, we think that there are lots of ways that through not only just the material, but also through the use and application of that material, uh, that we're providing advisors, administrators, and participants um, with a way to expand their toolkit, uh, put more tools in the toolbox, and uh, meet student needs uh, even more. We uh, now have an opportunity to come back to uh, Charlie um, and uh, the ways in which we kind of combine these initi uh, initiatives and uh, move forward uh, as partners here. So Charlie, I'm going to go ahead and turn that back over to you. Have to mute here. Um, thank you so much to Jennifer and Lynn for, for discussing both of these great initiatives. Um, I do think it's important to understand that that both the work that Nikata is doing and the work that APL is, APLU is doing is really part of a larger culture shift across an institution and truly across all of higher education today. Um, we know that state after state um, is moving toward uh, funding based on performance, funding based on graduation, whatever the case may be. Uh, however, your state may be defining that, which creates a huge culture shift for our campuses, a culture shift that's away from teaching and more to learning, and how those two pieces must fit together. And these two initiatives, I think, have the opportunities to, inv to invigorate campus conversations. And those conversations can't be just um, from one advisor to another or from one administrator to another, we're really talking about communicating up and down the pipeline on our campuses. The exciting thing to me is that regardless of whether you take advantage of these two particular uh, projects that we're doing, each of you have the ability to begin that level of culture shift and communication shift on your own campuses. How are you communicating above to those who may be at higher decision-making levels? How are you communicating to them about what academic advising is? Are you sharing the Nakata Journal or the Nakata um, Academic Advising Today or a piece of research on the APLU uh, website about what advising is doing and connection there? And then as a top-level administrator, 
how about you, you having that opportunity to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with academic advisors? Many of your campuses are forming academic advising um, um, councils or collaboratives or groups. What a great opportunity to bring together an administrator and a group of advisors to have a really down-to-earth conversation about what do students need and how can we meet those needs. It's a part of the ongoing student success commitment that all of our campuses internationally are moving toward. I recently had the opportunity to attend the UCAT, which stands for the United Kingdom Tutoring and Academic Advising Group in the UK, their conference in April. And it's exciting to see that it's not only in the US, but it's across the world that the concept of student success and that commitment to student success is being discussed at all levels. Uh, Nakata will be hosting its international conference in Sheffield, England this summer. And one of our keynote speakers is from Sharjah in the United Emirates. How exciting to have someone from the Middle East talking to a group of advisors and administrators at all levels from across the world about academic advising from an international perspective. This ongoing student success commitment is how higher education is going to change the landscape of our country and out of our world. We all know that the value of a college education does nothing but increase every single day. But that student experience in achieving that, that undergraduate education is really what is so vastly important. Academic advising is key to that student experience. It creates that difference between a student simply doing what I call parking lot class, parking lot type of education to a truly engaged education, engaged in their own pathway engaged in their own learning and engaged in their own decision making because we're not making decisions for them we're teaching them how to make those decisions on their own and the conversations that academic advisors and presidents and provosts and deans can have about how we create that type of experience is really what's going to change higher education and move us forward and i am a strong believer that the work that APLU is doing and the work that the college is doing really will lead us to that, as well as just the open dialogue that all of you, us in this room, all 450 of you now, um, need to be having on your own campuses of how we build those together. So um, at this point, I think we have a few questions that, that people have asked. And so Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it back over to you um, to kind of guide Lynn and I through the question and answer part of this, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you very much, Charlie, and, and thank you uh, to both of you. Uh, this, is, this has been informative, and I'm, I just really enjoyed learning even more about uh, APLU uh, through this whole process. And I noticed in our uh, Q&A, uh, some participants had some questions about advising at Middle Tennessee State as they moved from one method of delivery to another and how they reorganized uh, for advisors in that. And just a reminder that I, and Lynn, maybe you could speak more to this, that sure. campus chose the changes that based on their analysis and research was best for them. Right. And Lynn, I know that you've been on campuses and APLU has been on campuses where um, some campuses are going in the opposite direction. Absolutely, and I think what's really interesting is that uh, Middle Tennessee actually visited Georgia State when they were um, embarking on these changes, and Georgia State did the opposite. So Georgia State, um, about 10 years ago, really looked at their campus, and they had a decentralized system, and they decided to actually centralize advising in, a, in an interesting way, because they decided to centralize advising for um, 
students in their freshman and sophomore year. And once they have um, all of their freshman and sophomore credits and have selected um, a major, then they move for their senior and ju uh, junior and senior year into advising at their individual colleges. But the majority of that advising is centralized. So Middle Tennessee visited that institution and then, you know, really did an assessment of what was going on with their students at their institution. Yes, did decide to have this. It's a way of having a decentralized system but really with a centralized reporting structure. Um, similarly, and Georgia State's one of the institutions that we highlight, that we visited and highlight in our course. Um, another institution took a slightly different but also similar approach. Um, Colorado State University also highlighted in our course. Um, again, decentralized, has a decentralized advising model in the departments, so not the colleges, but the departments, but then they have what they call um, an academic success coordinator in each department that re reports to the student success uh, president um, who is right under the provost and is a joint report to the act to academic affairs and student affairs so it's really about you know in visiting all these campuses what I really found is that it's really about that infrastructure of collaboration that facilitates those lines of communication and being really in touch with the specific needs of your students and your campus absolutely Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons uh, you'll often hear effective practice as opposed to best practice. Mm -hmm. Institutions vary so much uh, that, that identifying the almost the 5,000 foot view, like when you hear of another great practice, what are the conditions that yeah. created the success? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, both uh, Charlie and Lynn have touched on that. Uh, throughout this time here, it's it's the communication, it's a commitment to, to a culture shift, yes. it's all of the partners being at the table. Uh, what a big difference. These, mm -hmm. these institutions that are highlighted um, and that have been part of Nakata webinars uh, for these uh, last several years, yeah. you, you've seen a whole campus uh, get get their ducks in a row or get their wagons headed in the same direction. They're, they're talking to one another Charlie, what would you suggest uh, for institutions that have a, uh, they don't have the same robust training and development uh, budget uh, and, they're, and they're, they're just starting this process? What would you uh, recommend? And we have some questions about campuses that are organizing around adult learners or at-risk students and some questions also like, where do we begin? Um, I, I, I would like to kind of go back to something you said a little earlier, Jennifer, and I think it's um, important. And that is that it is so key that campuses do their own self-analysis of what exists, what your student mm -hmm. needs are, um, who, what your mission is, what type of institution you, you have, in order to truly create the, the academic advising plan or model that fits your campus. A lot of campuses, um, and I've worked at one in particular, uh, we did advising one way because we had always done it that way. And there was very little analysis of really what our students needed. Um, instead, we did it based on that's the, the historical perspective. And so when we talk about culture shift, we're talking about many times taking the history and turning it upside down many times and looking at it and realizing that who our students are today may not be the students we had 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 10 years ago today um, as campuses change as we see many many community colleges changing their mission to state colleges we see a lot of changes occurring in higher ed so it's that self-analysis that's important that we do um, I think it's important that we recognize that not every campus is going to have the same level of financial support for academic advising as other campuses do. I think one of the reasons that is the case is because that self-analysis hasn't been done. Because if you haven't really analyzed what your needs are, then it's very easy not to put money toward academic advising or towards student success initiatives. So I think beginning with how do we build that consensus or that culture of self-analysis, that culture of scholarship, that culture of inquiry about what we're doing or what we're not doing, I think becomes extremely important. Um, another project Nakata is in the process of working on that I'm, I'm very excited about 
is partnered with the John Gardner Institute to develop a, a process in which campuses can do their own self-analysis of academic advising over a year long term with guidance from us in how to work through that process. Um, you'll hear more about that this fall, but I think it's an opportunity for campuses to really recognize that that self-analysis is key as you move forward. Um, the next piece I think, and someone mentioned it earlier, or, or one of the questions is if you're shifting from a, a faculty to a professional, how do you deal with that issue? I think what we're really talking about there is role definition. And on many campuses, the, the role definition of, of advising has never actually been defined. You know, when we talk about a faculty advisor, what is that role of a faculty advisor versus or in contrast to a primary role advisor? Uh, what's a faculty mentor? How does that differ from a faculty advisor? And that comes down to doing that analysis and that role definition. And so a lot of what we're talking about is taking the time, the effort, the energy, um, what works, a latest book by John Gardner and his team talks about we have all the pieces we need. You know, we have grit, we have energy, we have passion on our campuses. We need to put all of those pieces together and really spend the time to analyze what we're doing, which is what happened through the APLU project as they worked with those campuses to really analyze what they were doing and then be able to communicate that. And so as we work with campuses, I think that becomes key as we move forward. Um, Jennifer, that's probably much more than you wanted me to say, which is nothing new. <laughs> I have no comment uh, to, make, <laughs> to make about that. Um, uh, let's see, Lynn, uh, I, I know that uh, both Charlie and I and you have uh, kind of gone through and, and looked at some of the uh, questions that are here, just answered a great question about um, uh, faculty advising, and I, I think it just dovetail completely with what Charlie just said. We need to get everybody at the table that includes faculty advisors, and uh, we need uh, campuses to share performance and demographic uh, and their data analytic information, getting everyone to the table to understand what is happening at their campus. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I know those videos that you were able to do as part of that uh, project, the SMART project, uh, illuminated all of the different strategies uh, that um, administrators and faculty uh, undertook. Did you, do you have um, one really terrific example, Lynn? I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Sure, I'm, um, I'm looking, there were multiple questions I was, you know, um, and a lot of what we offer in the course is, is exi examples of answering these questions. I would say though that you know, I do see a lot of, you know, how do I get the quote higher ups to also hop on the wagon? Um, I would say that we've had, um, you know, particularly, um, you know, uh, the three four year institutions that we highlighted were able to hire um, new advisors. However, the two uh, two year institutions did not hire new advisors. Right. So they had the same capacity, one of which is Austin Community College, which serves over 40,000 students at 11 different campuses. So this can be done without, with, I mean, with maintaining those, you know, not ideal, very high caseloads. Um, I think that what we have seen is that there's been a lot of project, project level leadership um, to really drive that movement forward and then engage the, um, you know, the presidents and the provosts through that work at the project level. Now, I think, again, this gets back to that campus specific context. I think that it's really important to know, um, it, do you have a, 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 I mean, the best scenario is to have the, um, the executive level and the project level leadership working side by side. Um, so I think that that is, you know, um, a challenge. Um, but I think that it's not something that can't be pioneered by um, the project level leadership. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of questions like that. And again, that's a little bit of a nebulous space, but I would say that we have a couple of examples that we highlight in the course that speak to that experience um, of, you know, starting out as a smaller project and then moving into um, something where the president really got on board. Um, I think that one of the questions here is, you know, we don't, we do not have um, 
uh, a retention coordinator or an advising czar, I do think that that is a, you know, an advisable practice. And again, that's um, what's been really successful at institutions that we've looked at um, is actually being able to hire that person to be that point person um, and coordinate it's really about coordinating all of these different services across campus and creating that cohesion. Um, and sometimes that would just take one, one individual at least to kind of have their, um, you know, their fingers in all of these pots and to make sure that everyone's communicating. Um, uh, one of the other questions I'm seeing here was about um, the advisor, um, advisor as mentor um, versus a, and changing those roles, and I think that Charlie really spoke to the importance of being, what we found is that clarity of role is really important. Um, and I would say that um, actually what one really interesting story, Middle Tennessee, again, I'm focusing on them, but, um, but they, they, um, they changed their advisor role. So they had had previously the, um, the um, faculty members had served in more of an advising um, capacity at the colleges. So this was a significant change for how some of the faculty viewed their role. And they were very, very strategic in hiring. So they hired advisors and they also, you know, developed this advisor, advisor, manager, dean system. Um, and they wanted to make sure that they then had a clear role for the faculty as well. So they engaged the faculty senate and they actually got someone on board who was very well, um, you know, was trusted and um, well respected within the faculty community to really get on board early about how this role would change and really engage the faculty in defining what their role would be in collaboration with those new advisor managers. And the advisor managers had meetings with the faculty and really worked together to clarify, okay, we'll be taking this part and we'll work with you to then, you know, basically have a better process of getting the students the information they can only get from you as a mentor. And it's pretty impressive. And there was one person that we interviewed, this anecdotal, but um, who uh, was a faculty member who told us openly and in the videos that she was against it and lobbied against it, and then now she's fully on board. So. That is terrific. Those um, are great did, stories. Um, did, Charlie, can I jump in? What, just one quick Sure, yeah, of point. course. Um, and I, I think there's a couple of um, things I, I, I need, I really want to say. Um, a couple of folks have said, what data, what data analytics do we need, what information? I think the key piece there is that's part of that analysis that your institution must do. Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize, and, and I, I just can't say this enough, and that is that there is not a silver bullet. There's not a magic bullet to solve your problem, and there's not a piece of technology to solve your problem. And that when you're talking about data analytics, you need to decide what do you want to know about your students, about your institution, and about what you, where you want your students to go. That's mm -hmm. the data you need. And then be sure that whatever system you tend to move toward, whether it's a homegrown system or a purchase system, that it provides that data that your campus has defined. It's important that your campus take that role, take that leadership. Because if others define for you what data you need to know, all of a sudden it's someone else talking about where your campus should go and you're no longer involved in that process. And that's so important for advisors and chief administrators and advising administrators and faculty to be a part of that conversation. Regardless of what a faculty member's role is, everyone advises every single day. So even if a faculty member doesn't, it doesn't have an assigned load, they need to understand what their role is because students are going to be asking their questions. And so how do you bring that together? I think moving to a centralized model, someone said they don't want to alienate faculty. I think when faculty are involved in that decision making, when faculty are involved in discussing the issues that need to be talked about and the issues of why a change or culture shift is needed, then you don't have that problem. It's when we don't bring folks into the communication path that we have that, which is why I think this project between LPA, APLU and Nakata is really so valuable because it does provide that common language. 
back to where we began this at, at one o'clock, which is how do we create a carbon language for conversation on our campuses? The questions have been fantastic. I wish we had another hour yeah. um, to talk about them all and discuss them all, but I see Jennifer has her Charlie shut up. Look, it's time for us to end. Um, and so, um, Lynn, I want to thank you again so much for all you've done and all APLU has done. Please give Megan my personal thanks as well, your executive director, um, and, uh, and thank you for allowing Akata to partner with you in this way. And thank you much, so much for um, everyone who joined today and um, for allowing us to, inviting us to partner with you on this work. We're really excited um, about where this could go, particularly in light of this partnership. Um, I did want to say, are we going to put the, where you can find out more information up on that, the slide? Yes, that last slide, Jennifer. Okay. Yes. Great. Yep. And uh, what also we'll do, we will um, um, uh, 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 render this and then put it up on our website and also we'll uh, make sure APLU has a link as well. And we'll capture some of the chat questions and make everybody an anonymous questioner. Uh, so uh, what happens in the webinar room stays in the webinar room, but we'll answer those questions online for participants, especially if we didn't get a chance uh, to get those to you. Uh, or to answer them uh, within the webinar. Thank you so much to uh, uh, APLU, the, the delightful Lynn Brabender. We're so excited that you were here. Thank you to Dr. Charlie Nutt, uh, the awesome as always. And thank you to you, participants, members, uh, friends, and colleagues. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. We hope we have helped you make a difference or will through sharing this, this uh, webinar up the chain and uh, back also to all of your colleagues who are doing this work. Um, you can, uh, we thank you so much for everything you do for students. This is Nakata uh, signing off. Uh, thank Thanks you so everyone. much for joining us.